right, good morning, everyone. And some of you uh, will be looking at this uh, sermon, uh, this video recording later, but we're also uh, meeting live. And we have our, on Thursday nights, we have been studying off and on through the months. We've been studying from the Gospel of Luke. And also on Monday nights, I am going through a year study with Bible study fellowship on the, in the gospel of Matthew. And today we're, and next week, God willing, we're going to look at something that Jesus said in what is called in Matthew chapters five through seven, the sermon on the Mount, but in Luke chapter six, it's called the sermon on the plain. It's probably the same sermon preach a little bit differently at different locations. So it's two accounts, one on a mount, one in a plain, but um, there um, he's addressing some of the same things that he addressed in uh, the other sermon, but uh, only slightly differently. And, and it's not like many preachers today, you know, a lot of preachers today will give the same sermon or Politicians will give the same speech as they go from one place to another, but it will change a little bit sometimes depending on the audience and so forth. And I would suppose that that's what's occurring here with Jesus in these two sermons. The one in Matthew we call the Sermon on the Mount. And unlike many people do in their sermons, and I suppose even politicians and speech makers as well, uh, Jesus doesn't just give a, a beautiful speech and never apply it. He's not like a painter that just mixes beautiful colors together, but never applies those beautiful colors to a wall or to a canvas. So at the end of these sermons, uh, Jesus makes some very pointed applications, and he calls on his listeners for self-examination and for action. And I think you're going to see that he is speaking to every single one of us as well, even though these sermons were preached uh, almost 2,000 years ago. So um, we call it building our life upon a sure foundation. And Jesus begins this sermon in Matthew chapter five, uh, 7, uh, this part of the sermon, at least in verse 15. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Uh, depart from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And then, of course, we have the end of his sermon in Luke chapter 6. This is called the Sermon on the Plain. And um, Jesus says here, uh, it's very similar. You'll see it's not exactly the same. Verse 43 no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the 
good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what it, the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not say, do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck against that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. And so these are the words of Jesus in these two uh, different places. And so we want to begin by looking at what Jesus says about the fruit tree. He begins, the, this is the very end of, of his sermon, both of these sermons, where he uh, says these words. And he begins uh, his application, you might say, of what he is saying by uh, using a very obvious illustration from nature. It's, it's one that everybody knows is true, no matter where they live, anywhere in the world, everybody knows it's true. He gives this fruit tree um, illustration. And in Matthew, he, gives, he, he begins by talking about watching out for false prophets. He said, they'll come to you dressed in sheep's clothing. They'll look like sheep. But he said, it's not true. They're actually wolves, ferocious wolves. And he says, here's how you're going to recognize them. You're going to recognize them by their fruit. And then he goes on to say, a good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree, bad fruit. But bad trees, we cut them down. They're not productive. When we want fruit from fruit trees and they're not producing that, we cut them down. We throw them into the fire. He says, that's how you're going to recognize false prophets and people who are not true believers. And then he says uh, basically about the same thing in Luke. He says uh, he doesn't include false prophets and the wolves illustration, but he does say the same things about uh, the fruit. So very simply, you can see that what Jesus is teaching is the tree. Every kind of tree is known by its fruit. If you see an apple tree, you don't think, well, that's an orange tree. You think that's an apple tree. And vice versa, if you see an orange tree, you don't think, well, that's a grape tree or an apple tree. No, you think, well, that's an orange tree. We, we know a tree just by looking at its fruit. Now, if it didn't have any fruit on it, we might not know. A lot of us might not know what kind of tree it is. But when you see the fruit on a tree, you know uh, that you know exactly what kind of uh, uh, tree that you're looking at. So Jesus then goes on to say that the same is true of people. A good man, an authentic believer, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, will be known by his or her actions. Believers have been spiritually uh, regenerated, that is, made alive again. They have a renewed heart. We, we are a new creation on the inside. We are indwelled by God's Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now motivates us to obey God and and desire to obey his word and his commandments. But a person who is not regenerated, who's still dead in their uh, trespasses and sins, they're still separated from the life of God. That is, they don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. Regardless of what they claim about themselves, the true condition of their hearts will be shown by their actions, Jesus says. It will be seen by their speech. And the principle has been explained, explained something like this. Uh, there's an organic, or organic connection between the way that we are on the inside and the things that we say and do on the outside. And we can see this with trees. We can also say, see it spiritually with people as well. Uh, it does not do, Jesus uh, is teaching here, to claim to be a true believer of Jesus Christ if the way you speak and the way you act isn't backed up uh, by the way you uh, speak and act. And the way we live and the way we speak reveals what's going on on the inside in our heart. That's what Jesus is teaching here. So 
Jesus wants to drive this home even more powerfully in the, at the end of these two sermons in Matthew chapter seven and then in Luke chapter six. And so he gives this illustration of two builders, one building a house on a good foundation and one building their house on a foundation of sand. And so I want to look at this, uh, especially today and next week as well. Many of us have heard the song, don't build, or, or it's called uh, Sandy Land. Um, many of us have heard this song. And um, I'll sing it to you. I won't, I won't sing that last part um, because uh, they harmonize this last part, Rock of Ages clip for me, Let Me Hide Myself and Me. We sang this song live just a few moments ago, and it's a wonderful song. But um, the one who wrote this song has uh, incorporated it into their song. But I do want to sing uh, the first couple of parts there of this song. And you, you may have heard it. I, I think our family started hearing this around 1990 or something. That's the first time I remember. So according to this, it was written about 1981. So it was about 10 years old, I suppose, when our family first heard it and we were teaching it to our small children. But he, here's the way it goes. Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Well, it might be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. So you'll have to build your house once more. You better build your house upon the rock. Make a good foundation on a solid spot. Oh, the storms may come and go, but the peace of God you will know. And it's really a beautiful song. They harmonize that first part with that second part there, but uh, I won't do that today. But, but anyway, that song right there, of course, was uh, written um, uh, on this uh, passage that we're studying about these two houses, these two builders, the two foundations of these two houses. I want you to notice that uh, Jesus prefaces his Sermon on the Mount by asking a question. That's the way he prepares the way for this parable. He says in verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So now he's about to start this parable of these two houses, these two builders, and he starts it by asking that question. Now, um, Matthew has a little bit more extended of a, an introduction, preface to this story that we're going to talk about. And uh, he doesn't ask the question. He just makes a straight uh, forward assertion, Jesus does in Matthew. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. To, away from me, you evildoers. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is this repetition of the word or the name Lord. Lord, Lord. You'll see that they say, Jesus says they're saying to him in both of these passages. Now, why the repetition of the word Lord? Well, Jesus wants us to see that they're, they're expressing uh, ferventness, earnestness, enthusiasm. This isn't someone who's just merely secretly confessing that they, are, uh, they belong to Jesus. This is someone who's speaking openly and enthusiastically and earnestly. Uh, they're fervently confessing allegiance to Jesus Christ. And I also want you to notice when you look at these uh, passages that Jesus doesn't criticize them for calling him Lord or for even saying Lord. No one is a true believer, in fact, who, who fails to confess that Jesus is Lord. Look at um, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Jesus, uh, Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we have to declare Jesus is Lord. We have to confess this, he says. Verse 10, for it is with the mouth that you believe and are justified. You're made right with God. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile that's a non-Jew, the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Jesus, we have to call upon Jesus as Lord. And Jesus isn't criticizing these people in this parable that he gives us of these two uh, house builders. He's not criticizing them for saying, Lord, we have to confess Jesus as Lord. Um, so don't think that Jesus is criticizing the content, in other words, of their pr profession. Uh, the right, what he's saying is this, a right profession, however important in and of itself, as we see here in Romans 10, it's not evidence of a true and saving relationship with Jesus. A lot of people can say, Lord, Lord, a lot of people we're going to see can act like they're true Christians, but they're really not. In other words, th this is a, a very frequent, sobering, solemn fact, and that is regardless of how earnest we sing songs, we tell people we're believers, how enthusiastically we do it, how often we profess to others openly that we are believers, it's a fact that many times these same people are not true believers. You see, there are those who profess that Jesus is Lord very openly and enthusiastically and frequently, but their profession is false. And why? Well, Jesus says, he gives the answer here. He says, um, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? A true believer shows themselves by obedience, by doing. And then this leads to this parable of these two houses. Now, I wanted to, I wanted to not neglect the introduction because it's very important. It's very important that we see very clearly there are two kinds of individuals. Jesus is illustrating two kinds of people with these two house builders. He has a mind of those who, who call him Lord, Lord, people who are listening and people who are hearing his word, as you can see in my underline of these passages, but he says, they call me Lord. They do not do, they say, everyone who says to me, it's the one who does. He says, uh, they hear these words of mine. He says that several times. You see, Jesus is talking about people in the, these two builders. He's talking about people who hear his word. They call on him. And they even call him Lord, Lord. They're saying the same thing. They're both claiming the same thing. They're both saying the exact same thing. Now, I think it's interesting to note who Jesus is not talking about. Jesus isn't talking about people out there in the world who never have any interest in Jesus, who are lost. Everyone would think, every believer, anyone who professes even to be a believer would say they're lost. They've never made any kind of profession that Jesus is Lord. They don't even care. That's not the content. The, the context here is not for those outside the church. This is people who are in the church or claim to be in the Lord's church. That's who Jesus is talking about here. The whole purpose of this is to picture uh, the difference between a mere professor of the Christian faith and a true possessor and a true professor of Christ. You see, a person who's really born again by the Spirit, made a new creation, who is a real child of God in reality, 
Um, he's talking about that person versus someone who merely thinks they are. Even though they're saying, Lord, Lord, even though they're doing a lot of things, doing the same things that a true believer sometimes is, um, they're not true believers. They're not true followers of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus often warns against this. He, he warns against counterfeit believers. In fact, in earlier in the Matthew passage, you remember he said, watch out for some of these people. They're actually wolves, but they're dressed up like sheep. There are counterfeit believers. All that glitters is not gold. We can even be guilty, Jesus is showing us, by deceiving ourselves and thinking and saying, saying and claiming that all is well with our souls when it's not. So as you can see, Jesus is teaching a very relevant subject, that Jesus is, the, uh, is a perfect teacher. He's the best teacher that the world has ever known. This is probably the greatest sermon the world that's ever been preached, this sermon. And this sermon is very relevant. This part of the sermon, just what he says about what we're going to talk about, the two foundations, the two houses, that's very relevant for us today. It's common to see people who are looked up to as great Christians who maybe even late in their life, they deny their faith. They're, the falseness of their faith is, is exposed in this life. But God's word is teaching us here that with many, it won't be fully exposed until the day of judgment. Here, here's what he says. He says, uh, many will say to me on that day, there's going to be a lot of people who will go right up to judgment and they will be shocked that the judgment is against them. And Jesus says there's many in this in this category. Many people think they're saved and they're not. Many people are going to die and expect to be received by Jesus into heaven, and they're going to be shocked by the very plain words it says here of Jesus. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In other words, you deceived yourself. I've never had any kind of saving relationship with you. You just thought you did with me. Now, Jesus would, Paul would say that, talk about these same people as well. Um, when he, uh, when he uh, uh, says what he does in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 about people who are deceitful workers, he says, he says uh, they are masquerading as um, uh, servants of righteousness. But he said the end will be what their actions deserve. In other words, again, just like Jesus, they're going to be exposed maybe on the day of judgment and all along they might have fooled themselves too. So what happens is we can see people going to the same churches. They can sing the same songs. They might even preach the same way, the same sermons. They might um, um, sit next to each other on the same bench they might be married to each other but in the end in the judgment they're going to be cast into a lake of fire that's never quenched god never has had a, a saving relationship with them now this is not a happy thought at all this this is the subject that jesus concludes with though in the greatest sermon that's ever been preached but it's so it's extremely important and you know, you may not like it, but thankfully, Jesus loves us enough to talk straight to us about this and to warn us. Why, why is he trying to warn us about these things? Because he wants to help us avoid this fatal, eternally fatal mistake. That's his purpose. That's why he gives this, this uh, parable, this story of two builders, two house builders. So in order to see the distinction between a false professor who says and maybe does many of the same things, goes to the same church, um, and then to see a true professor, Jesus gives the story of these two builders. And so there are similarities that I want to talk about today. Next Lord's Day, I want to talk about some differences between these two builders. So let's look at the similarities first of all. Well, first of all, you'll see that. Um, they um, 
and and we're looking at two people that represent one a true believer and one just a mere professor of Christ. They're not a true believer and a person who just merely says, Lord, Lord. And so they're saying the same words. So what do these different houses represent that these two people have um, that Jesus is talking about here? Well, these two um, houses are represented in reference to a flood. So these houses are built in places of refuge. They both want their houses to keep them uh, sheltered from the flood, uh, the rain, the strong winds that Jesus uh, uh, brings up. They're both building houses to be protected uh, from these elements and for comfort. And so that's what many people are building their house upon. Um, and both of them feel assured that uh, their soul in this world is safe. They feel assurance of salvation in this world and in the world to come. And then they both have, um, they both have um, deep, uh, they both have foundations. One builds deep and the other one, and he, and he builds upon a solid rock. The other one fails to do, do that. He simply builds upon sand. And what do these two uh, foundations represent? Well, they represent uh, that upon which a person's profession or sense of peace and security is built, that which gives them confidence that they have a true profession of Christ. And then, of course, there's the flood. And what does that represent? Well, the flood represents uh, that that beats upon these two houses represents the difficulties and pressures that come in this life that test every single one of us. And then ultimately, the great test where everything is revealed, the day of judgment. And so that's the picture. So what's the similarities? The similarities is, first of all, they both felt the need of a house. They both desired shelter from storms, didn't they? They both desired shelter from rain. And secondly, they both resolved to build the house. Both of them wanted to build the house. And in the third place, they built their house in the same location. And how do we know that? Well, <laughs> because according to this story, they're both subjected to the same flood, the same rainstorms and the same wind. So we know that they're, this is, they have both built in the same location. And of course, as I said, many people, true and false believers can go to the same church, even sit on the same row, might even be married to each other, you see. And then fourth, now both of these houses looked exactly the same. There's no indication that these houses on the outside above the surface looked any different. The main difference was the foundation. What was below? What you could not see, it was not visible. That those were the similarities of the two. So what can we learn from this? Well, there's three lessons I have here that I'll talk about uh, the similarities between these two houses and what and the builders and what they built. And next Lord's Day, God willing, we'll talk about some of the differences between these two. But first of all, this reminds us that a true professor of Christ and a false professor of Christ, they can have a lot of things in common. For example, they mo both may be impressed with their need of salvation and, and to be prepared for the world to come. And many listen to um, uh, Jesus and, and they know that they need a, a house. They know they need to be prepared for death. They know they need to be prepared for eternity. But that doesn't make you a true, a true professor of Christ. Both a true and false professor of Christ both feel the need for being right now and for eternity. As we see, they're coming up to Jesus. They're shocked that they're not saved. They must have thought they were. They must have known that they had some kind of need for them to ever have uh, attempted that in the first place. And they both have many of the same desires. 
a true professor and a false professor may both desire forgiveness of sins. They may both want peace for their guilty conscience. They both, both want fear from the freedom of, of hell. They both want to go to heaven. That's why they're both coming to church, you might say, in the first place. That's why they build their houses. And um, they want, both want peace from God. They both want deliverance from hell. They want deliverance from this guilty conscience and so on. A pseudo-Christian wants that just as much as a true believer. So the thing we need to see is that a true believer, someone who is truly saved and someone who's a false believer, can desire many of the same things. They both desire comfort, encouragement from one another when they go to church, uh, help in hardships, difficulties in life because we all struggle with these things and they don't want to be sad and discouraged. That's true of all people uh, who go to church, the true believer and the pseudo believer as well. Both of them desire the same kind of guidance. They're both interested in ethics and morality. They both may be interested in having social interaction with conservative people, you might say. They want their families to be around other people who are moral. And this can be true of a, of a true believer and a, and a false believer. They can even both have an interest in theology. You know, theology, the study of God's word and the study of God is good. It's interesting. But there's this danger of having a, an interest in theology and deceiving yourself that just because you like to study the Bible and you're interested in theology, and you might have a greater knowledge of God's word and theology that you must be a true believer. And other people below you, they might not or probably aren't. There are many, many, many things in the study of God's word that are extremely interesting for believers and unbelievers alike. Just like some people find interest in solving mathematical problems or, or something like that. In a similar way, there's many, many people who find great pleasure in studying and discussing theology. But I want to tell you something. The interest in studying God's word, as important as that is, the interest in theology, it's no certain sign that someone's a true believer. Because it's possible to be a pseudo false believer and professor of Christ and be interested in studying the Bible. Um, and a false professor may just be going to church or maybe wants to be a minister because they like they have a desire for spiritual power. Remember uh, Simon, he was called Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. Philip an evangelist went down to this area and he was preaching the true good news about Jesus Christ. And then later on, Peter and John would join him, but all three of them were working miracles. Those that's powerful. They were working miracles. The message about Christ was turning people to Christ. And there were many true conversions and Simon the sorcerer was watching this, and he was very impressed. Now, he was a sorcerer who had gained a pretty significant following himself. But when he saw Philip and Peter and John, he was extremely impressed himself with the miracles and the conversions and the followings that they had. And so when Peter and John came down there, he saw they're the ones who can get me this power, he thought. He, he asked them for this kind of power. And, and when he did so, he revealed the true um, nature of his heart. What was driving him all along was to have great influence, to have great power. And Peter strongly rebuked him in, in um, Acts chapter 8. He says, your heart is not right with God in the sight of God. And there are many preachers, and many ministers who are unconverted people. They're unconverted, and they might even preach a gospel that saves other people. 
but their real concern, their desire is for power. It's for popularity. It's for money. And this is a, this is a godless pursuit and desire. In other words, they can build a beautiful house. It can be adorned with all kinds of beautiful things, furnishings of their Christian profession. They can have a big following at church and make a lot of money and people look up to them and praise them. They may give their whole life to this and they may deceive themselves into thinking that they're a true Christian when they're not. Because the real dominating drive of, their, of his life maybe is nothing more than self-glory. It's not, he's not being driven by the Holy Spirit. It's Satan driving him with the desires of this world. And many can be enamored by this. They become enamored with someone and they maybe want to be a preacher themselves because they see, huh, here's people that get to preach and talk in front of people. They get notoriety. Or maybe they think they make a lot of money. Some of them might. They're popular. They've got power and influence. And, you know, a lot of people, I see a lot of people, they just have this great desire to be, they want to get up on Sunday morning. They want to give a lesson at church, or they want to have a Bible study or um, be a teacher in Sunday school class. They're desiring glory for themselves. But can you see that you can desire all these things and convince yourself that you're a believer? that you're true. And you might even think you're an exceptional believer because you might know more about the Bible than people who are true, but we'll call them ordinary believers who listen to you. You see, but it can be true that you're not even a true Christian at all. Remember what Jesus said? He says, he's going to tell them on the day of judgment, he's, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, don't you remember we prophesied in your name? Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. You never preached in my name. You didn't serve as a missionary in a foreign lane, in that land in my name. You never gave sermons or preached lessons or having had Bible studies in my name. You never gave sums of money in my name. You were never faithful to go to all the services of the church. You never cast out demons and did they? He doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't deny that they did all those things. Jesus said, no. He says, I'll tell you plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You were a minister. You were a missionary. You were a faithful, attending, professing believer. You loved studying the Bible. You gave tremendous sums of money to the church that was used for good. But Jesus is going to tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What do we learn from this? Well, it's possible to do all these things and not have a saving relationship, a relationship at all in reality with Christ. Plainly, as Jesus would say, those things in themselves are not clear evidences that someone's been born again. They're truly a Christian. Can you see from this that it's possible to have a false sense of salvation, a false sense of forgiveness? Now, this is not a pleasant subject. I know that it's not a pleasant subject, but Jesus is trying to get us to think about it. And we must think about the state of our souls. Some people hardly ever give a thought about the state of their souls. I think people would tell you, I've heard people say that they've been told, I haven't thought about, you know, the state of my, I go to church, I don't think about the state of my soul. And, and for decades, I think there's a lot of people who never, they go to church and never think about the state of their soul. But Jesus wants us to think about the state of our soul, our relationship with him. A true believer will have fears about self-deception. You see, being deceived like th these people that Jesus is writing about, this one uh, bad house builder. A true believer fears that 
you know, maybe they're deceiving themselves. And you know what that does? That drives them afresh to Christ. A true believer is not quick to speak peace, you might say, to themselves without evidence. Not what everybody about him or her is doing. Not about his, what his or her parents taught them to believe and raised them to believe. A true believer is not afraid to be tested by the word of God. He or she wants to be sure that they have a solid foundation, that it's built properly, and it's going to stand on in the final test. So if you've never been troubled about, the, about this danger of self-deception, you need to think about it. You see, not, you know, I think a lot of people preach God's word and they always think, well, yeah, others need to hear this. Well, no, I'm talking about you and me. There is such a thing as having a false peace. There is such a thing as having a false assurance. And I believe that a true believer is constantly concerned about this self-deception. And as I said, I think constantly, this is what drives them to Christ, their need and, fit and, and their feeling, their need for a savior. So, and they can be found in the same location, the last point there. And we said that as before, a true believer and a false believer can be sitting right next to each other on the same row, attending the same services week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, listening to the same preacher, mouthing the same words, participating in the same church activities. This is what's possible. This is what Jesus teaches us. Okay, so I'll stop there, but God willing, I will. Uh, conclude this next Lord's Day because we've talked about similarities. These are similarities. Next Lord's Day, we're going to talk more about the differences, the contrast between these two builders and their houses.